Well, hello YouTube, it's me, Fortmaster, and welcome to something new. This is Everything About Gaster's Motif in the Deltarune Soundtracks, a musical myth-busting odyssey. And this was a suggestion that I got a while ago by James Connolly's Mustache 735. That's a screen name and a half. So, yeah, I mean, from what I, from what I remember, because granted, it has been a while since I've played Deltarune, I'm still you know, waiting for the next chapters to actually be released. But yeah, I think the, you know, uh, the only time I can remember uh, that you actually come across, well, actually, do you? Because that bunker the, at the south of town, all you hear is like garbled up noise when you listen to your, uh, when you listen on your cell phone next to it. Actually, yeah, never mind. I can't remember where you hear like um the gaster motif in Deltarune. Huh. Yeah, so this is definitely going to be a more of a learning experience than I thought it was going to be. So, yeah, I mean, let's get this thing started then. So, of course, original video is linked in the description if you haven't seen it for some reason. Corner video will lead to my Let's Play of the Day. So, yeah, with all that out of the way, let's get this thing started, because this has definitely been uh, one of my more uh, mysterious suggestions. Um, so, I definitely want to get into it. Where do I even start? I guess I'll try the beginning. Gaster's theme, also known as MUS underscore ST underscore him, him. If you go to the game's yep. files, is a short loop of music that can be heard in Undertale under very specific circumstances. First, more than <laughs> step zero really, you'll want to be playing on patch 1.001 .001 or later, because in the original release of the game, reaching Gaster's theme was impossible without save file editing. Second, your file's fun value, a random number between 1 and 100 generated each time you reset your save, must be exactly 65. Third, you need to walk north out of the save point room in Snowden where boxes are introduced, the path that normally leads to a dead end by the riverbank. Finally, make one last 50-50 coin flip, and congratulations, you found the sound test. <laughs> this weird, slightly scary menu lets you select and play such banger tracks as... and... These songs exactly. are very cool and that they have no relevance to anything. The fourth and final track, though, is Gaster's Theme. We know this because it's called Gaster's Theme. It sounds like this, and once you start playing it, there's no way to stop. The other options don't work anymore. All you can do is mash your keyboard for 20 seconds until the music suddenly cuts out and the game flashes you this message. <laughs> and plops you back in Snowden. Gee whiz, we said in 2016. I sure bet that isn't foreshadowing anything. Fast forward seven years. Yeah, that... Oh god, Undertale. That was so long ago. Years and... Oh boy! Yeah, he's everywhere! What's, what's that? What are you doing? Do you have a permit for this? To cut a long story short, this obscure little piece of shit was now the most famous four notes after... Why did this happen? <laughs> well, you know why. And if you don't, this isn't the place to find out. There's about a thousand other perfectly good videos going over Gaster's significance to Deltarune in mind-numbing, marrow-sucking detail at this point, so Part please just oh, watch no. one of those. If you're a Deltarune lorehead who's made it to current year without getting up to speed on Gaster lore, then honestly I'm starting to think you're maybe just operating out of spite at this point. Regardless of how we got here, the fact remains that Deltarune fans have made quite a hobby out of sniffing out where Gaster's theme might be creeping its way into the game's score, and I'm right there with them. Toby's been using music as a vehicle for storytelling at least since Homestuck, and with Undertale and Deltarune, he's pushed the technique so hard that you'd have to be literally deaf to ignore it as an avenue for analysis. And even then, Beethoven could probably still pull it off. <laughs> I have, however, seen many instances of what I believe is the fanbase getting a bit too caught up in the Gaster Gold Rush and pointing out quotes of his theme that just aren't really there. So for this video, I thought I'd finally wring some use out of my half a music degree and look into the matter myself. Hopefully, by the time we're done, we'll learn a bit about arcane Deltarune lore mm. and music theory. Sound good? Sounds good. Let's sure, go. okay, let's go! I've been over what Gaster's theme is, but not yet what it is. Musically, I mean. First off, it's the theme of Gaster. Yes. For the purposes of this discussion, a theme is basically a motif, and since Toby Fox is in the picture, you can bet your favorite ass cheek that motif is of the light variety. And I don't mean like the Pepsi. I'm talking about light motifs, a word that, as a Toby Fox fan, you've definitely heard tossed around, but might not know the exact meaning of. So yeah, um, surprise, surprise, I do not have a music degree. Though I have heard those words thrown around a fair amount of times. So, let's talk about it. 
First off, leitmotifs are motifs, but most motifs are not leitmotifs. At its most basic, a motif is just any recurring pattern in a piece of music that contributes to its identity. And by pattern here, I mean a pattern of notes, rhythms, specific instruments, anything really. Yep. Just mostly notes. The music world's favorite example of this seems to be the from Beethoven's Fifth Symphony. This little four-note flourish doesn't represent any particular person or concept, it's purely musical. And it represents the music! As the symphony progresses in a remarkably narrative-feeling way. It's almost like the motif is the protagonist of an invisible story, going on adventures and undergoing character development in an abstract world that we can hear and imagine, but not see. What was that game playing in the background? Anybody who's watching this and actually knows, I'd very much like to know, because that looked kind of cool. Huh, interesting. Kinda makes you wonder what would happen if you took that abstract storytelling potential and made it concrete. Enter Richard Wagner, born 1813. Yes, Wagner! Theater class, hobbies, cuckoldry, fleeing countries, bassoon elongation, socialism, racism, queer baiting the king of Germany. Wait, what? Yeah, he was kind of a weirdo. Yeah, I, well, I'm, a weirdo is one way of putting it. Yeah, okay! Anyway, Wagner was a dude who made operas. He wrote a lot of music, he wrote a lot of characters. One day, something occurred to him. Over the course of an opera, characters tend to go through arcs. Similarly, over the course of a piece of music, motifs tend to go through development. Arc, yeah! Two parallel media, two parallel evolving entities. So why not just stick them together? Oh god, no! And thus the leitmotif was born. A fragment of music that represents a thing and a story, and undergoes musical changes to reflect any narrative changes that occur to that thing. Oh, okay! Just like the characters they often represent, leitmotifs are a combination of consistent and variable elements. To claw my way back into the ballpark of the original topic, here's <laughs> Sans. Here's Sans' theme. Here's Sans with osteoporosis. Here's Sans' theme, but lounge jazz. Here's Sans dressed like an arcade carpet. Here's Sans' theme arranged like an arcade carpet, etc. Clearly, we have major changes between each of the examples here, but there's also a stable core of fundamentally Sansian features that lets us identify them all as representing the same character. I never, okay, I'm going to be honest. I never uh, noticed the Sans, like, influence on those other uh, parts before. Well, I mean, maybe a little bit in the, in the, in the uh, this is the music where you fight Sans, but like, in the other ones, no. Like a Stretch Armstrong doll, a leitmotif can be bent pretty far out of shape before becoming unrecognizable, but this malleability is also what makes the task of identifying leitmotifs so tricky, especially in the context of Gaster's theme. How much of a I would imagine. can be changed before you get a ship of Theseus that can no longer reasonably be called the same motif? Where do you The last one? Press C for music, HUD. Okay. Welcome, everyone, to the Deltarune Motif Comparison Apparatus 666 <laughs> Billion. <laughs> the function of this device is, much like a prism, to refract a single motif into a rainbow of constituent features. Displayed in the central monitor is Gaster's theme, written in standard musical notation. Let's hear it. Yep, that's Gaster. Yep. If you don't read music, that's okay, because music notation is weird, arbitrary, and overall just a bit shit. It packs together simultaneous information about pitch, tonality, and rhythm, which can make different excerpts hard to compare at a glance. The radial modules of the DMCA 666 unpack this information. Let's start and what does rhythm. it mean? Here on the right, we can see that Gaster's theme is played at a speed of 110 beats per minute. A beat here refers to the length of one of these notes, with no curly tail, also called quarter notes. Gaster's theme, however, is written in curly tailed eighth notes, which last half a beat and are thus twice as fast. There's also sixteenth notes with two tails, which are twice as fast as eighth notes, and so on. Okay. The absolute duration of each note doesn't really matter though, since 4 eighth notes played at 110 BPM is the same as 4 quarter notes played at 220 BPM. What matters here is that all 4 notes are the same length, meaning Gaster's theme has a steady rhythm with no variations. In other words, it's really boring, and not a very distinctive feature of the motif. Looking okay. at yeah, how makes sense. other light motifs, such as Heartache, Spear of Justice, Alfie's,
Okay, so I, 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 I so again, I, I don't have the, I don't have a musical degree, so, but I did know, uh, notice, of course, the, the Toriel and Asgore, like, mirroring in their music. I never got the one with Undyne before, and I, I never noticed the one in the True Lab. You know, I, 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 I've always said that my knowledge is, like, I have, like, an ocean's breadth wide of knowledge, but with the exception of, like, a very few instances, it's only, like, a couple of inches deep. It's stuff like this that, like, hammers home and makes me remember that fact. Etc. We can also see that rhythm is often the first thing to change when a motif gets remixed for a new context. So, unfortunately, this module won't be the most useful for identifying gastro quotes. RIP IT, it OFF! looks cool, though, so I'll keep it here for completeness. Aww. Next up, we have the interval module. Please accustom yourself to the sight of it. We'll be spending a lot of time here. So, first and foremost, an interval is the distance in pitch between two notes. To explain why they're so important, I'll ask a question. What's a song from the Deltarune soundtrack that starts on this note? Think about it, 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 and time's up. If your answer was checker dance, you're wrong, since the background music's been playing in the wrong key this whole time. If your answer instead was, I have no fucking clue, Andrew, this is impossible, yeah. you're on the right track, since most humans, even including trained musicians, are really, really wow. bad at identifying pitch. There's a reason why people that have perfect pitch is generally made a big deal. <laughs> even I know that. But wait, how does that make sense? Isn't hearing pitches half the point of music? Well, yes. Yeah, but it's a combination is, but of different ones. Hearing in that case is relative pitch. That is, how different the pitch of each note is from the surrounding notes. I would believe that you, for me, almost, I'm thinking of it almost like, like, just having one note and trying to remember a song that starts with that one note is almost like you have a barcode, but you only have the one bar. It's like, it's, it's completely useless without the rest of the thing attached to it. Or from a fixed reference point, like the root note of a key. Standard music notation specifies the absolute pitch of each note, the kind you can't actually hear. The reason for this is that you need to know absolute pitches for stuff like playing the music on an instrument, but when you just want to analyze how the music sounds, dealing with note names like A, B flat, and F is kind of like comparing long jump records using geographical coordinates. <laughs> Theoretically, the same information is there, but it obfuscates the part we actually care about, the distances. And so, what the interval module displays is simply the distance, or interval, between each note to the next in a given melody. The intervals are measured in semitones, which is the pitch difference between two adjacent keys on a piano, and are prefixed with either a plus or a minus sign depending on whether the interval goes upward or downward from the first note. In Gaster's theme, for example, we start on A and move up one semitone to B flat. We then jump up seven semitones to F, back down seven semitones to B flat again, and finally back down a semitone to A when the theme repeats. The beauty of describing a melody like this is that these intervals don't change when the theme later shifts down a semitone to start on A-flat. In that sense, these four numbers, 1, 7, negative 7, negative 1, are the fundamental fingerprint of Gaster's motif, and huh? given its simplicity in other areas, I believe this is by far the most important feature to look for when identifying it. Oh, there is, however, okay. a catch. Of in course a there always is. Track, even a leitmotif's intervals are not immune to change. Just look at your best friend versus finale. Or sands versus raining somewhere else. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so I know this has literally nothing to do with the music, but like, I when you just see like these bunch of different numbers and stuff like that, you have to wonder like, what kind of messed up math calculations are we doing here? <laughs> when this happens, this is why I watch stuff like this by people who actually know what they're talking about. I, it, like, I love Undertale's music. It has to be, like, one of the best soundtracks of all time, if not the best. Uh, but, like, stuff like this, I would have never connected that, but that, like, so much of it was motifs, and I already knew that so much of the music was motifs based on one another. <laughs> Though it's usually in motifs with much longer and more complex melodies, meaning their intervallic fingerprints are hefty enough that they're still recognizable even if you ignore the size of the intervals and just look at whether the notes go up or down, what you'd call the melody's contour. The up-up-down-down down contour of Gaster's theme, by contrast, is so incredibly basic that if we use it as our only standard of comparison, we can find Gaster's theme turning up in some very, uh, surprising places. Oh! I 
I, okay, so just for the sake of simplicity, I think we should n narrow down our search radius to Underdale and Delta Room. <laughs> Otherwise, we're going to be here literally all day. So, yeah, we need the intervals. I mentioned a second ago that Gaster's theme's intervals don't change when it's transposed down a semitone. This was a subtle reference to the fact that, after four repetitions, Gaster's theme transposes itself down a semitone. This is a distinctive enough feature of the theme that I gave it its own unit on the DMCA 666, okay. the transposition module. This one's pretty simple. A transposition just means shifting every note of a melody up or down by a number of semitones. For melodies that are more firmly rooted in a key, this often requires tweaking some of the intervals, but Gaster's theme isn't quite tonal enough to care about subtleties like that, and just shunts every note down uniformly. I love that. It just doesn't care. It just doesn't. <laughs> Speaking of which, we have the tonality module. This thing should probably just be called the key module, but that looked really bad in this font, so I went with a slightly fancier term. Ooh. I'll be up front here. This thing is not useful for analyzing the light motif. It is, however, an excuse to talk about more music theory. And so Wonderful! <laughs> Musical key is a bit of a weird concept, since it's really two different bits of information glued together. A piece's tonic note, and its mode. Take the key C major for example. C is the tonic, meaning the root note the key's built on top of. And major is the mode, which is okay. basically just a list of, aha, uh -huh, intervals that you follow from the tonic to see what other notes get included in that key. I think we've, I think most of us have heard, like, know of, of like, modes, or at the very least, majors or minors in some case, um, because, you know, it appears in, like, meme culture from time to time, just like, oh, take this song and switch it from being in major to a minor, and it sounds completely different. It sounds, like, melancholy and sad. Or I saw... Oh, oh what was it? There was one... They took the X-Files theme, and I think they put it into major, and it sounded like it was from, like, like We Resort or something. Yeah, this was it. Or also, I saw one where they did um, the Imperial March, uh, you know, Darth Vader's theme, and they transported it up to a minor key, and it was the it was the alternate dimension where everything went right. Like, Oh, I love that. The interval pattern for the major mode is 2-2-1, two, 2-2-2-1, two, one, two, 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 one. but there's also minor, Dorian, Lydian, Mixolydian. I have literally never heard of any of these besides major and minor before. Blues, and many more. It's pretty easy to hear what mode a piece of music I is in, I didn't think but blues was its own key! Like discussed in the interval module, it's almost impossible to tell by ear what the tonic is. Surprisingly though, this is not always the case. Back in the good old days, Western classical music was played using a different tuning system called Just Intonation. Describing exactly how it was different is, uh, a little complex, but basically it had the uh -huh. effect that moving a key to a different tonic actually created tiny changes in the spacing between the notes, giving each key its own subtly unique sound. In modern times, though, we instead use this hack job system called Equal Temperament that irons these variations out and relegates the role of the tonic note to a sort of dippy sonic zodiac sign. We changed it because that previous one. I mean, granted, it looked a lot more complicated, but it's, it looked like it sounded better. At least from the listener's point of view. Oh, right, we were talking about Gaster. Yeah. Uh, yeah, thing is, Gaster's theme doesn't really have a key, or if it does, it's, it's so short. to pin down exactly which. The uniform downward modulation creates a set of notes that don't fit nicely into any common mode, as far as I'm aware, and it's more likely that Gaster's theme just wasn't written with a definite key in mind. Postmodern. the keys of other tracks we discuss up here anyway, though, because it's fun trivia. Last but not least, we have the miscellaneous module. It's Repetitive, very spooky! It's a sack that hoovers up info too nebulous or contextual to give dedicated displays. Unfortunately, because Gaster's theme is so minimal, there's not a whole lot left to discuss about it besides the fact that it's quite repetitive. Ideally, I'd be able to dig further into the gory details of how the theme was produced, the instruments and effects and whatnot, 
but unfortunately I'm much more qualified to analyze music theory than digital music production, and so we'll just have to move on. Oh god, what's happening? So, Gasta's theme. Not too difficult to recreate, but Oh god, who's this? Very, very interesting. In FL Studio, Toby's DAW of choice, we can load up the Chrono Trigger sound font. Selecting the piano, I'll turn up the release of the notes, giving them a sustained effect. A lot of people don't know this, but Gasta's theme actually has a left-hand part. Let's do the main melody. Fun fact, this is the same piano used in another hymn, which I'm sure Andrew will have more than a few words to say about. Do you hear the light motif? Do you, do you hear it? For the post-processing, <laughs> the main effects we hear are a delay, some EQ tampering to give it a sort of radio telephone effect, and reverb to give it some space. MORE REVERB! And that's it for Goss's theme. Take it away, Andrew. Ah, uh, a rabbit creature did it for me. Say thank you. Nice. Hold up one second though, if Gaster's theme does actually have a baseline, the added harmonic information might give us just enough evidence to actually assign it a key. As it turns out, it's kind of in D minor. Huh. Well that's neat. Ever oh, wonder okay. what Gaster's theme in a major key sounds like? No? Well, too bad, apparently it's this. <laughs> I'm not sure if this changes anything, but I'll leave it down here in case it's useful. I was just about to ask him to play it and Oh my god, you know what that just reminds me of? Again, it has nothing to do with this, but you remember like there was a time where like basically like like any meme was just, hey, take this and then play it in G minor? Or was it G major? Oh god, I have to go down memory lane again. <laughs> No, yeah, it was G major, and, oh god, I forgot how horrible it sounded. Alright, I've kept you waiting long enough. Let's analyze some Gaster sightings. The way this is gonna work is that I'll keep the data from Gaster's theme itself on the diagram in these green-colored sections for reference, and display the data from each perspective quote with yellow color coding. If that gets confusing, just remember, green for Gaster, and yellow for Yo dog, I think I just heard a light motif. <laughs> Some candidate excerpts will be longer than four notes, but that's okay, since the actual Gastery part can, by definition, only take up about four notes at a time, and that's what I'll be focusing on. Also, for visual clarity, all the music notation will be shifted into the octave that puts it closest to Gaster's theme in the treble clef. As okay. for where the candidate Gaster references are coming from in the first place, the examples I've gathered are a combination of my own investigation into the soundtrack, basically just going through each piece sequentially while listening really hard, and this 2019 video for media motifs that attempts to catalog every occurrence of Gaster's theme in Chapter 1. Now, across all my okay. previous videos, I've avoided directly commenting on the work of other channels. The reason for this is twofold. One, my scripts can come off as kind of snarky and I don't want to start a flame war over nothing. And two, I can think of better uses of time than setting out to individually counter every Deltarune theory I disagree with, such as reading Higurashi or jumping into a volcano. This time, though, it's a bit different. Based on pretty much every conversation I've had involving the combination of Gaster's theme and Deltarune, this one Media Motifs video seems to be the touchstone for the fandom's collective knowledge on the topic. A quick YouTube search confirms this. Not only does Media okay. Motifs seem to be the only sizable channel filling this niche, their Gaster video also has a Christopher Moon comment, which is the only true marker of success within this industry. <laughs> the problem here is that, by the creator's own admission, this video was never intended to be taken that seriously. Not only does Media Motifs seem to be the only sizable channel filling this niche, their Gaster video also has a Christopher Moon comment, which is the only true marker of success within this industry. The problem here is that, by the creator's own admission, this video was never intended to be taken that seriously, and unsurprisingly, following that disclaimer, it contains a lot of sketchy information. Oh, of course. Unfortunately, and yet predictably, the video's self-awareness of its own limitations hasn't stopped a large number of people from consuming its contents uncritically and proceeding to parrot its findings ad nauseum in Discord chats worldwide. All that is to say, I bear media motifs no will will, but this topic is long overdue for a second opinion. Mm -hmm. Now, let's get into it. Okay. Again, I don't think I would have ever connected the oh. dots here. Well, that was easy. 
So, I've got good news and bad news. Another good him! news is that in precisely one try, looking at the very first song in the Deltarune soundtrack, we've been handed a specimen of Gaster's theme fit for display in the fucking Smithsonian. <laughs> it's so convenient, it's almost like someone, I don't know, planned it to be the first thing you'd hear after starting the game. The bad news is that this is the last time Toby's gonna hand us a win remotely this free. Getting into the details, you can uh, see that not much has even been changed. The intervals are perfect, as is the note order. It repeats very similarly to the original, except for the doubled first note, and even modulates downward, albeit by a whole tone instead of a semitone. As if this wasn't already enough, the melody's even played on the exact same Chrono Trigger piano as the original theme. In the face of all those okay. similarities, and the fact that it's literally the only melodic content in the Exposed. whole track, the tweak rhythm barely makes a dent. It's super duper just Gaster's theme. We're off to a strong start here. While not as brain dead obvious as another I hymn, the master quote here is pretty solid. It's one thing to stuff a motif down in a musty, half audible bass line, but here the gastry bit arrives right at the entrance of a very exposed melodic phrase, front and center. The trick with this melody is that it's two weak quotes of Gaster's theme on either side of one perfect quote. I'll call them A, B, and C respectively. In A, the top note only goes up four semitones instead of seven, and in C, the fourth okay, note only drops yeah. down a semitone. I couldn't hear that. I, I didn't hear that the first time, but yeah, yeah, I can see. Yeah, I, d I can see that definitely. Okay. Before transitioning into a mostly unrelated conclusion. In isolation, these would both be very poor matches, but once we throw in B, an intervallically perfect gastro quote, it recontextualizes both A and C as variants of itself. A having been tweaked to work as a Scarlet Foresty lead-up to the full motif, and C being tweaked to wind the motif down to a Scarlet Foresty conclusion that has no equivalent in Gaster's original, endlessly looping theme. Okay. At risk of yeah. oversimplifying, this is kinda just how melodies are made. You take a simple motif, make a few tweaked versions, copy-paste them around a bit to add length, and plug the gaps with unique material to keep things fresh. <laughs> and in this case, I think there's a decent argument that the underlying idea this melody was constructed from was Gaster's theme. As for why it appears in the background music of the Scarlet Forest, I'm less sure. We'll just have to see if it's the start of a pattern. By the way, if anyone's interested in learning more about this process of elaborating motifs into melodies, 8-Bit Music Theory has a banger video about Gwyn's theme that covers it. I'd recommend checking it out. Okay. Man. Okay, before even looking at the music, this track comes with about 50 pounds of baggage we need to unpack. First off, it's yeah, please not originally help. from Deltarune. What? Toby first released it in 2012 under the title Waltz of Sekom Masada, as part of a short Yumi Nikki tribute album. Now, I'm no Yumi Nikkiologist, but according to the game's wiki, Sekom Masada is this guy, an NPC you encounter in front of a huge keyboard in a spaceship. He looks kinda like the Mystery Man sprite, I guess, but sort not of? as much as Uboa, who's also a Yumi Nikki character. Second piece of baggage is that this song plays in the hidden egg rooms, which I know a lot of people already associate with Gaster. The oh god, those those egg rooms. I even I replayed Deltarune one and two to try to get, you know to try to get like better you know stuff for when the the for when the next chapters drops when I can t continue my playthrough, and I wanted to try to get those egg rooms. I just I I, I couldn't do it. It was such a pain. This is actually surprisingly simple. Just kidding, it's not simple at all. But people do seem to like the Sieve gaming bits, so. The secret rooms in Delta Room contain a man behind a tree who gives you an egg. In the true labs from Undertale, there's a fog filled room where Frisk can interact with invisible objects described as feeling like a man and like a tree ripe with fruit. After clearing the fog, both objects are revealed to be refrigerators. One of the few places you can put eggs in the secret rooms is a refrigerator in Asgore's house. The original occupant of the true labs was Gaster, therefore. Gaster confirmed. Okay, <laughs> enough. music now. Despite occurring at the beginning of an exposed melody, the gaster quote here is quite sketchy. Really, it's just the first three notes, and even then, the order of the first two is swapped. What saves it somewhat, though, is that this melody actually repeats modulated down a whole tone, just like another hymn. It's not exactly the semitone modulation from the original, but the effect is almost the same, and it still adds a lot of credibility to the potential gaster connection. Okay. Of course, this track, including a deliberate gaster reference, would have some capital I implications about how long ago gaster's theme was conceived, since Waltz of Sekon Masada dates back to 2012, but to keep the video focused, let's just ignore that for now. Moderate. All 
Alright, here's the part where you learn why I spent so much time going on about intervals. The purported Gastrocode and Cardcastle is, unlike previous examples, in the bass line. That's not a huge deal, Beethoven hides motifs in the bass, so Toby can too. Yeah, what is okay. a huge deal though is that this pattern isn't Gaster's theme. As discussed, Gaster's motif is characterized by a semitone on the bottom and seven semitones on top. The card castle bass line is seven semitones on the bottom and two semitones on top. Yeah, but it's basically a mirror. A seven chord. Not only are these intervals different, it's not even a case of just shifting one note. As far as I can tell, the simplest way to turn Gaster's theme into this bass line would be to move the bottom note a semitone lower and then flip the entire thing upside down. But safe to say, that's not actually the thought process people are going through when they hear Gaster's theme here. In terms of audible similarity, it's really just the contour. Up, up. Yeah, again, I I did not hear Gaster's theme in that at all. Up, down, down. Widening the net that far puts us back in the hell dimension where Adele and Chopin have referenced Gaster, so <laughs> I'm not a big fan of this one. Very brain rot. Rules card. Oh boy. If you thought Rules Card was bad at designing puzzles, just wait till you see him try to reference Gaster's theme. Referencing the game, I still can't believe that they had to like put the add the add-on thing in the um uh in chapter two, that's it, I'm sorry. Uh that it's pronounced rules. <laughs> of course it's spelled like that then. This shit is literally the first three notes of a minor scale played as a harpsichord ostinato. In terms of motivic content, it's much closer to referencing Meet the Spy than W.D. Gaster. Oh, yes, Meet the Spy! April. Hey kids, ever wondered what the musical equivalent of that Peter Griffin anime girl illusion will look like? <laughs> no? Huh, no way, me neither. Thankfully though, that doesn't matter, because whether he meant to- No, definitely not, no. To or not, Toby Fox has already made it. April 2012 has repeated rising and falling arpeggios, almost the same baseline from Card Castle that everyone thought was Gaster's theme. Okay. Constant whole tone and semitone modulations. Oh and god, the square wheels now. Played by weird inharmonic instruments that obscure the exact notes and push you to focus on the contour instead of the intervals. It is a CIA grade Gaster hallucination machine. Okay. April 2012 does not have Gaster's theme. Oh, wait, never mind. It does. Just only for one moment in the last quarter of the track, after gaslighting you for 15 seconds. <laughs> Very cool, Toby. Thanks okay. for that. Chaos. If this sounds familiar, it's because it's the same bass line from Card Castle being played on electric guitar. Well, I'm gonna have to go back. At least. I'm gonna have to go back and listen to all these again because, like, all of this is rem is reminding me that I haven't actually listened to the Deltarune soundtrack or the Undertale soundtracks in like so long. This is making me want to like just take an afternoon and just li just have a playlist playing on repeat. Very high brain rot. No. In the original media motifs breakdown of this track, they indicated two potential quotes of Gaster's theme in different places. The latter example in the left hand of the piano is quite a stretch. It's just four notes cherry picked from a six note arpeggiated chord with the wrong intervals, and yeah. usually even for sketchy quotes of Gaster's theme, four unique notes instead of three. I'd say in terms of objective similarity that the left hand piano part of Fallen Down is actually a better gastro quote than this, but that's kind of like saying your Starbucks venti cup is more likely to be the holy grail than a Bourbon Street hand grenade. <laughs> the first example, on the other hand, Okay, yeah, definitely. Kinda sounds like Gaster's theme. It's nearly an exact quote, except that the fourth note drops down eight semitones instead of seven and prematurely returns to the pitch of the starting note. Another point of similarity is that the pattern repeats after a downward modulation, this time by four semitones instead of one, but you know the drill by now. The effect is still similar. Yeah. What really sells it for me though is that by referencing this motif, the melody is forced to emphasize the seventh scale degree on the first note. Unfortunately, to explain exactly no. what I mean by that, we'd have to I, 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 again, to grab no idea what the context of that is. Chord tones that would culminate me basically summarizing the entire concept of functional harmony, which <laughs> would be fun, but it would also take a very long time. So instead, I'll just say that this note occurring both at the beginning of a melody and on the first beat of a bar means that it's heavily accented, and as such, you generally expect it to be a stable tone, like I don't know, the tonic or something. Instead, though, the okay. melody proudly plonks out a scale degree seven. 
note, which is just about the most unstable note you can get without leaving the key entirely. Overall, this isn't that weird of a move, musically speaking, and there's certainly plenty of reasons to do it besides quoting Gaster's theme, but it's at very least striking. It calls attention to itself, and gives the impression that the melody is highlighting the slightly dissonant sound of Gaster's theme rather than trying to pretty it up and make it less conspicuous. All said, it's not the craziest revelation to find a Gaster reference in a song literally named after Darkness, but it's still nice to know there's more at work here than pure confirmation bias. Hey, yeah, I c yeah I definitely can see that. The second half of this track features a very prominent Gaster adjacent pattern in the bass line, but once again, under close inspection, the intervals fail. No, yeah, I definitely don't the hear that. The closest it ever gets is this first arpeggio, which is composed of two semitones on the bottom and five semitones on top, meaning both intervals are slightly wrong. Still, the sheer emphasis the bass line puts on this pattern means we can at least grasp at straws by saying it's a loose variant of the motif that was reinterpreted to fit the track's more upbeat mood. With every media motifs Gaster citing so far, I've been able to at least break down my reasoning for why I did or did not think it resembled Gaster's theme, but in this case, I'm sincerely not sure what I'm even supposed to be hearing. The no, yeah, sounds a tiny. I, yeah, again, like apart from like the notes being you know semi close, like position wise, I don't hear it at all. No. A bit like Toby's old Homestuck track, Penumbra Phantasm, which. Well, is not Gaster's theme, yeah, and the specific part highlighted in the video is just four descending notes, which is obviously absurd. At the very end, though, we do at least get a partial match for the first three notes of Gaster's theme, so I assume media motifs meant to highlight this and just made a mistake at some point. In any case, even if this quote isn't purely hallucinatory, like I first thought, pressure! it's still not much very to high, yes. Oh, the circus. Uh, this is a bit awkward. While there is Gastery material in this piece, it turns out to just be quoted from its much meatier older brother in the soundtrack, The World Revolving, which is next on the docket anyway. Yeah. So, to avoid repeating myself, I'll defer the analysis until then. First though, it's been a while since I've done a video this long, and it's my qualified opinion as someone who once took a psychology course in first year university, that all the iPad babies in my audience are in dire need of a brain break. And you know what that means. Psych. We don't need a break. No! We need to talk. I realize my vibe can come off as kind of aloof, but I've been in this game for a year now, and I'm wise to word on the street. I've heard what people say. Andrew's videos are good, but his theories are always so safe. He's too afraid of being proven wrong to ever go out on a limb and table anything really interesting. Oh, if okay. If I wanted to know that Toby Fox wrote Deltarune's narration, I would read Wikipedia. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, I get it. I'm not mad. I only brought this up because I want you to keep one thing in mind. Everything that's about to happen next... You asked for it. Oh no, what's happening? You heard right. Get your great Anansis and Shara X's out of here. That's baby shit. Papa Fox is home now and he's brought his own Mega oh, no. Caster fan song. Think I'm joking? Well, the answer is yes but only for the passive-aggressive rant a minute ago. <laughs> I do genuinely believe, as I have for years now, that Gaster's theme is the core motivic component that the world revolving was built from. Or to be precise, it's what the so-called freedom theme that comprises the song's middle section was built from. Let's give it a listen. That's a much longer excerpt than we've seen so far, but no, yeah. the beginning for now. I mean, literally, just look at it. The notation isn't lying here. No. Every single note on the right matches one from Gaster's theme, just a semitone higher. Frustratingly, I can't say that this is a 100% perfect quote. If we look at the four notes in the middle, the interval module shows a clear discrepancy. However, in this case, it's a little off. the intervals actually exaggerates how much has been changed. The notes themselves are all still from Gaster's theme, it's just that the order of the last two have been swapped so the melody can end on the more stable tonic note. Or alternatively, if we just fill in the suspicious pause created by this one elongated note... Huh, would you look at that? So again, actually going into theory mode here, so that does kind of feed into the whole thing where... It, like, at least if it is Gaster, it seems Gaster has messed with a lot of people in the Dark World. 
So, of course, you have, like, Jevil, who's been driven literally insane. Um, you have potentially Spamton as well, though he was also talking about a guy named Mike. So, I don't know, but it seems like Gaster might be the main villain, or at least the, the like, the puppet master behind a lot of things going on in Deltarune, at the very least. On to the second pattern. At a glance, it looks pretty different, but the trick is that this F-sharp bottom note here is actually the same thing as the F-sharp top note of the first pattern, just one octave lower. If we shift it back up, suddenly it's clear that this pattern is just a rehash of the first one with a single note change to create a more fluid walk down to the F-sharp. Oh, okay. After that, we get one more direct quote of the first pattern, and then it trails off into a more freeform conclusion. What I want freeform. to stress okay, here is yeah. that this is the freedom theme, or super boss theme, or whatever you want to call it. It's the same melody that reappears in Big Shot later on, and it clearly holds a lot of significance within the game's light Big Shot system. Again, that has, again, Big Shot. I love World Revolving, but Big Shot. Oh, that's a favorite Deltarune music so far. It's a melody filling a very unique role that would obviously face a ton of scrutiny by the fan base, and that you'd think would provide Toby a golden opportunity to inject some totally new ideas into the soundtrack. And yet, from what we've seen here, most of its musical identity is ripped straight out of Gaster's theme. This, more than any prior example, makes me suspect an overriding motivation. We're not even done though. The shared part of the freedom motif ends there, but Jevil's version decides to stick around for a bit and basically pop the fuck off. Wait a minute. Play that again. Yeah, wow. there it was, yep, there it was! Just four copies of Gaster's theme in a trench coat. <laughs> the top note goes up each time, sure, but that doesn't mean there's four different musical ideas here. It's really just one idea, Gaster's theme, that's been just getting higher and higher and higher each time to turn the top notes into an ascending melody. And again, the following material simply arises from extrapolating that one pattern. Its contour is echoed again here, 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 and here. Just with the notes changed to fit whatever the current chord is. They put, Gaster's theme is, I I was gonna say like, it's like it's sprinkled any, everywhere here, but this is like, it's a key ingredient. The sum of all these factors is that I not only believe the freedom theme references Gaster's theme, but that it very well could have been the result of Toby Fox sitting down at his piano and explicitly deciding to arrange Gaster's motif into a raucous boss track. It doesn't have to have been made that way, of course, but it is a hunch of mine. Let's no, call it yeah. A theory that this was the intent, Aww. and that the answer to the age old question of what music if Gaster was boss lies not in the countless fan made interpretations, but was secretly under our noses the whole time. Toby, you sly dog. To chapter 2. As okay. of the time of writing, there is no Media Motifs video for Gaster's theme in the chapter 2 soundtrack, meaning we're officially in uncharted waters. Oh no. As a result, expect to see fewer candidates, because I can't analyze what I don't notice in the first place, and I'm not brave enough to take the Jaru approach and pull my entire viewer base for every four note melody in the soundtrack that one of them happened to hallucinate Gaster's theme in once after 40 hours of sleep deprivation. <laughs> To start us off, we have something that actually well, kind of surprised door, me. Really? Noelle's theme, or specifically what seems to be its default version, Girl Next Door. It's a track that I'd honestly slept on until starting this project, partially because it only plays for one lighthearted scene at the beginning of the chapter, and partially because it's quickly overshadowed by its gloomier, more suggestively titled remix, Lost Girl. Oh yeah, Des. As it turns out though, listen for a few moments with the right mindset, and... Boom. That's a Gaster. Blatantly Gaster. It's in the bass, sure, but that bass line is the first new part to enter the song, and nothing else comes in with it, making it very prominent. On top of that, this isn't a case of some Gastery notes being tossed into an ongoing melody. This bass line comes out the gate with a statement of Gaster's motif, and the motif is echoed in the first few notes of each new phrase that plays after it. Okay, so this, that is, that is weird. So we know that her, her sister is missing. Well, missing, quote unquote. We don't know if she's actually missing or, you know, just 
missing. But, so is this, so what I'm wondering now is, is this literally just using these notes because they sound good, or does, or is Gaster somehow connected to her? The thing on the cake is that this melody pulls the same starting on an accented scale degree 7 trick that Darkness Falls does, just actually on scale degree 7 this time and not 2. One might even say, come to think of it that I originally planned to have the explanation of unstable accented notes here, but then copy pasted that section of script into Darkness Falls without updating the scale degree number. <laughs> Oopsie doopsie. Moving on now to our next- But, but wait, wait, there's, there's more. more! This is not a drill, folks. That wasn't the only Gaster reference in this song. Wait, really? Eight seconds in, the Lost Girl theme enters on some sort of uh, glockenspiel with a whammy bar. I don't know, it doesn't matter. Point is, the melody of Lost <laughs> Girl actually contains the its own Gastery bit. Technically, it's a quote from the Freedom motif, but it's the Gastery bit of the Freedom motif, so... Fuck, I guess Gaster's theme follows the transitive property now, why not? Oh no. Anyway, in Lost Girl proper, this quote is quite brief, but during its appearance in Girl Next Door, this happens. <laughs> it's extended Fuck. into a repeating pattern that fills two full bars. Hearing one reference to Gaster's theme in a song can feel like you're being winked at. This feels like a taunt. Hmm. That is weird. Um, so anyway, Queen's theme. Ah, yep, there it is. Right at the beginning. It's actually okay. identical to the first eight notes of the Gastry bit in Scarlet Forest that I already talked about, just transposed to a minor key. So a few of my thoughts on that should carry over. But with the pattern cut so short, most of the structural arguments I made in favor of the Scarlet Forest quote no longer apply, and so this one's a lot easier to brush off as coincidence. Yeah, okay. Speaking of Scarlet Forest, remember when I said it was weird that Gaster's motif would be showing up in a random area theme, and that we'd have to see if it was the start of some sort of pattern? Well, I'm happy to report that the answer to that question is yes, but actually no. You see, my one hunch for why that motif would be tied to the Scarlet Forest was that it alone of all the Chapter 1 zones contained the secret egg room, which, as discussed, carries at least a faint odor of W.D. Gaster. Okay, yeah, I guess that just makes some sense. you'd hope to see in future chapters is a Gaster quote in the background music of whatever area contained that chapter's egg room, since it would be a valuable piece of evidence linking the egg man to good old mystery man without having to run the conspiracy corkboard hell gauntlet from before. <laughs> The good news is that Gasser's motif is, indeed, referenced in Welcome to the City, the music for the Cyber City area that contains Chapter 2's Egg Room. The bad news is that the part of Welcome to the City containing the motif is just a remix of the Cyber Field music, which obviously then also has the reference despite not having an Egg Room and the hypothesis implodes. Okay, yeah. Oh shit, I didn't talk about the music at all. Okay, basically this melody is similar to the world revolving, and then it opens with this one lightly modified gaster quote, and then proceeds to mash control V and use echoes of that pattern to fill up basically every subsequent bar. The pattern itself isn't okay. quite a solo out of a match as in the world revolving, but no. it gets an equally huge amount of emphasis, and so still makes for a reasonably convincing reference. Really? Okay, I'll take your word for it. I literally just talked about this. Yeah. Got to save time wherever you can. This is Queen's theme again. Yeah, very, yeah. Man, we are just flying through these ones. This is Queen's theme again. Again. Keep the bangers coming, Toby. Ah, shit. He actually <laughs> did keep the bangers coming. Who could... <laughs> All just, it's it's just, it's it, it's a uh, wait it's all queen always has been could have possibly foreseen this i for <laughs> one i'm gobsmacked okay if you think this is redundant just be grateful i couldn't detect any gaster residue in the sweet cap and cakes as theme <laughs> I'll be here until the next down the rabbit hole upload oh god yeah speaking of which i wanted to do a reaction to that uh, to the to down the rabbit hole because I I watched them all for a while before I started doing reactions. But then the first one they release after I start doing relax reactions is five hours long. No, thank you. This is the last one, I promise. Yeah. 
Big shot, here we are. Hey, Avery, it's Big Shot, number one rated leitmotivic Petri Dish 2021. If you know anything about this track, it's that it's a mashup of no fewer than five different themes, to the extent that it could pass as the soundtrack to a fucking Homestuck Flash. Nah. Fortunately for this video's runtime, though, Big Shot's intersection with Gaster's theme is entirely contained within its reprise of the Freedom theme that I already ranted about for two hours in the World Revolving segment, so there's nothing new to actually say here. Again, Gaster has messed with a lot of people in, these, in this series, hasn't he? Dial tone. As weirdly popular as this track seems to be with the fan base, it's really just a note for note reprise of the world revolving. Strictly speaking, it's not the same part that I covered in the previous world revolving segment, but it still quotes the main freedom theme pattern, and as such, inherits most of that song's gasteriness. Okay, okay. I didn't, again, okay. I didn't even hear that, so. Flashback. I wish we had a bang to end on here, but regrettably, the soundtrack declined to provide one. What is flashback? I've never heard that one before! What it did provide were a couple extra malformed gaster arpeggios in the Snowgrave exclusive track, Flashback. Oh, Snowgrave, of course. I haven't played Snowgrave, so... Seven, but the bottom is still a proper semitone, meaning it's at least arguably closer to Gaster's motif than the similar pattern from Friendship. Also, like in Friendship, the sheer stubbornness with which the song repeats this pattern is the main thing lending it credibility as a Gaster reference, though in this case the resemblance is furthered by a downward modulation. For a quote that's missing the key 7 semitone leap, this is about as convincing as I think we're gonna get. Okay. What's next? So, if you're anything like me, and I hope you are because that's the easiest demographic to target, <laughs> you're currently thinking something along these lines. Golly gee, Andrew, those sure were just 24 consecutive Gaster's theme sightings you analyzed from the Deltarune soundtrack. It was actually really exhausting and took a long time. What do I do with this information? Yes! And to that, I would answer, well, that's kind of your problem now, bucko. Oh, okay. Just like okay. the narrator video, the data is the point of this exercise, not so much the conclusion. With that said, a two-axis diagram probably couldn't hurt. Nice diagram, huh? Nice! Well, actually, no, it's kind of shit. The uh -huh. NCA666 soaked up a lot of the funding. Uh, it'll do, though. Here's what you're looking at. On the x-axis, ascending from left to right, is the likelihood of each candidate Gaster reference actually being a Gaster reference. In my estimation, of course. It's just the inverse of the made-up brain rot index that I spent the whole time assigning to the candidates. On the okay. y-axis, ascending in the usual sense, is how much the context in which each candidate track plays primes you to assume Gaster's involvement. In other words, it ranks how much you'd expect a given track to contain a Gaster reference, with the obviously Gastery stuff like Another Hymn floating to the top, and completely innocuous tracks like, I don't know, Friendship sinking to the bottom. Yeah, With okay. the axes arranged like so, we can divide the results by quadrant into four conceptual categories. In the bottom left, we have what I'll call the Null Candidates. Songs that shouldn't contain Gaster's theme, and don't. Not much else to say here. Sorry, rules, card night truthers. It's nothing personal. I just don't think your ideas make any sense or have merit. I just don't like you. In the you. top right quadrant, by contrast, we have the trivial positives. These are the nongshim kimchi flavored instant noodles of gaster quotes. They're delicious in the moment, and knowing that you have a healthy stockpile of them in the pantry bolsters your will to live in the wee hours of the morning. But at the end of the day, they're still empty calories. They probably do reference Gaster's theme, but you don't actually gain any new information by noticing that. Boy howdy, another hymn sure sounds a lot like Gaster's theme. <laughs> no shit, Sherlock, it's in the title. Zoink, Scoob, have you noticed that all the Superboss themes imply that Spamton and Jevil might have been influenced by Gaster? Mondo cool, Shaggy. I read yep. the textual evidence for the same thing on the wiki six fucking months ago. Moving on, on the top left we have a more interesting class of candidates that I totally would have thought of a really cool and academic sounding name for if it contained more than one single song. The Holy, judging by the context in which it plays, is something like a theme for the Dark Fountains. Dark Fountains are dark. Darkness, yeah. darker yet darker, Gaster. Very it dark, yep. Yeah. One problem though, the Gaster reference in this track is hot garbage. I would say it's not there at all, in fact. This is mildly surprising, but also not particularly meaningful, so I'm just going to ignore it. Finally, skadoodling over to the bottom left, we the good shit. High entropy Gaster references, ones that aren't expected and can potentially be used to predict future story events. I'll discuss these in more detail. 
First, we've got Man, aka Waltz of Sakon Masada. The quote here isn't the best, but it just barely clears the bar to lending one more shred of credibility to the Eggman being somehow related to Gaster. It's still very ambiguous though, I wouldn't put too much stock in it myself. Next up is Queen's theme. I'm not sure what to do with this one. Relative to how big of a reveal it would be that the chapter antagonists are associated with Gaster in addition to the secret bosses, this quote's just not solid enough to bear that weight, especially when the equivalent quote in King's theme is exponentially worse. Yeah? For April 2012, I don't know man. Even if Toby Fox crawled out from under my bed and handed me a ratified document professing that the quote here was 100% intentional, what would that really tell us beyond the fact that Gaster's theme has existed since at least 11 years ago? It would be interesting, sure, but not particularly insightful. Especially considering that I th Megalo Megalovania, another, you know, famous Toby Fox song, um, is like also very old. He's used it in several games. It was only once, you know, you get the sands in on the genocide route that that it kind of got traction. Next up, we have the three area themes, Scarlet Forest, A Cyber's World, and Welcome to the City. I've already detailed most of my thoughts on why this trio of candidates is so mysterious. The combination of Scarlet Forest and Cyber City once again suggests some relationship between Gaster and the Egg Rooms, but then a Cyber's World bombs in like the third wheel and blows that pattern out of the water. Maybe it is supposed to be meaningful, but the Cyberfield music was hastily copied from the Cyber City because of time crunch? That doesn't sound very likely to me, but the strength of these quotes demands some sort of no! explanation, and working with the information we have now, I don't know what else to give. Okay. This might just be a case of wait for chapter 3. Yeah, probably. Last but not least are two very different tracks with one thing in common. Noel Holiday. These are curious. I want to say they're the only candidates that truly caught me off guard during this analysis, but after giving it some more thought, I'm not sure how surprised I should actually be. Looking into Noel's connections with Gaster is sort of like when you learn a new word and suddenly start hearing it everywhere, which I guess makes it a bit like Gaster's theme itself. <laughs> okay. A lot of it comes from the Spamton sweepstakes, the story of the mysterious egg that appeared in her video game as a child, accessed by clicking a picture of the tree from the secret rooms. The maze level in Dragon Blazers only she could solve, and how it led her upward to a locked door unlike anything else in the game. Maybe neither of these events has any direct relevance to Gaster, but what they do tell us is that Noelle, voluntarily or not, has a knack for breaking games, for finding glitches and uprooting obscure secrets. Normally a pretty benign talent, unless, like Noelle, you happen to live in a game as well as play them. Oh. And so you come to the weird route. A little okay. creepy pasta style breakdown of Deltarune's plot, achieved through a series of surreal and seemingly nonsensical actions that are hinted at nowhere and are only possible through Noelle's presence. Despite being a deliberate addition to the game, everything about the Weird Root is designed to feel unintended, to simulate the experience of breaking through the game's bounds into something no one was ever meant to see. I could continue to wax poetic, but I think by now the parallels with Undertale's fun events should be pretty obvious. Oh. Noelle is a video game character who's blessed, or cursed, with finding secrets in video games. Gaster is a video game character cursed, or blessed, to be the secret. And that's without even getting into the unused Java cookie item that would have caused Noelle to see unreadable symbols when consumed, or opening up the whole can of worms that is Des, the lost girl who may or may not be the one crying out for help in these blocks of unused code that were clearly written expressly as bait for data miners. <laughs> sure, the voice in the code might not be her, and even if it is, who knows what specific circumstances it would imply, but you have to admit that it would be pretty fitting if Noelle searched for her missing sister and her fascination with prying easter eggs out of the dark corners of video games were in the end, one and the same. Okay. So, how's that for a conclusion to the Gaster music theory video? Bet you didn't see an impromptu Noel analysis coming. I no, definitely but not. That's just how the Lancer cookie crumbles. You sit down to analyze Gaster quotes for 30 minutes, and all that's left to say at the end is, um, Mayor Holiday, I'm afraid your daughter has Gaster's leitmotif as the first melodic content in her theme song. You <laughs> might want to get that looked at. Or, I don't know, just make popcorn for when she activates Goner mode in Chapter 6 and guides the party to the Gaster dimension. Up to you. I don't know what she's gonna Goner do or mode. she's gonna do it, but Noelle is going to do something cool, and it will be related to Gaster. That's my theory. Quote me on it. As for more standard outro -y stuff, first and foremost I want to give a big shout out to Toffee Bun for offering to help out with this project. I'm a big fan of their work, and not only are they responsible for that minute-long segment you probably noticed, but also the transposed version of Checker Dance and the quote-unquote Major Key Gasters theme. 
They're currently best known for their video about the production techniques behind the Undertale soundtrack, which I'll link below, but I hear they also have something new coming up, so maybe you should, uh, I don't know, subscribe or something? Okay. And you know what? While you're at it, check out Vivat Veritas. Completely apropos of nothing. I just like their Delta Rune takes and wish they had more views. Regular viewers at this point may find themselves asking, will there be a comment response stream? The answer, regular viewers, is yes. On Saturday the 24th at noon pacific time, I'll be live streaming myself responding to as many of the comments as possible. First come, first serve, so get in an early if you want yours read. In terms of the imminent direction of this channel, as many people probably know, I'm now deep into the process of publishing an indie game by the name of Random Access Mayhem. It's a roguelike top-down shooter type thing, you can check out my devlog if you're into that. Anyway, I won't mince words, that's going to be my life for the next few months. You plan to get a free demo out this summer, and the next video you'll see from me will almost definitely be a devlog. This doesn't mean the channel's never going back to Delta and stuff, especially if Toby decides to, you know, drop Chapter 3 at some point. Yeah. Come on, buddy, I'm starving down here. But if people are going to be giving me money on Patreon, they need to know what I'm doing with my time. Speaking of which, if you give me money on Patreon, you'll get your name made into a credit sequence like this in my next video, as well as other fancy perks like a different colored name on my Discord server, you know, the good stuff. Anyway, this video really, really needs to end at this point, so as always, I'll see you next time. And remember, as he pants OTP. Okay, so, okay. As I said at the beginning of this, I had no idea really what I was getting into because, you know, besides liking the sound of music, I didn't, I really didn't know that much about music theory. But with that, especially the connection to, to, to Noel. I never noticed that. Granted, um, when it comes to my experience with like theory crafting in Deltarune just in general, I am very behind and I'm well aware of that. So I might have to catch up and just see what people are talking about. Um, but also, Mr. Cunningham, um, if you do have more you know, Deltarune theories, I'm definitely going to have to see them. I mean, granted, like, we'll have to see. If you don't see another reaction or video of me watching his stuff, uh, then it either uh, wasn't that interesting or it wasn't that good of a reaction. So, hey, either way. So, yeah, with all that out of the way, that was that was really fascinating, really. So, yeah, um, original video is linked in the description if you haven't seen it yet for some reason. Corner video will lead to my Let's Play of the Day. And with all that out of the way, I hope you guys liked. If you did, leave a like, subscribe if you have not. And I'll see you guys next time. Goodbye.